of the uh, net of the uh, of the neuronal net that we have uh, used to uh, explain the spread of activity from a single uh, with, uh, from a single column to the surround column. Now, first a few uh, a, a few um, uh, experimental data. What you see here is the distribution of what's called hotspots. These are not resolved spines, but I'll come to individual spines. What you can see, there's a pretty dense activation. This is upon the principal whisker. To the, our surprise, when we, uh, uh, when we wiggle a surround whisker, the density of hotspots is almost as large, uh, in some cases uh, even larger, than what we see uh, when, we, when we wiggle the principal whisker. This map shows a key observation. What you see here is in different colors the location of uh, hotspots um, that are turned on when only the principal, uh, they are turned only on by the principal whisker. They are shown in red. The majority in this case are green. These are hotspots that are turned on both by the uh, uh, principal whisker and the surround whisker. And finally, uh, these are the green ones, the shared ones. And finally, uh, the blue ones is a minority that are turned on uh, only when the surround whisker is uh, activated. So what we have, uh, or what this experiment shows, is that in layer two dendritic arbors, there are three types of uh, input. One is specific for the principal whisker, the other one is specific for the um, uh, surround whisker, but the majority, or let's say half of them, is turned on both by the uh, surround whisker and by the principal whisker. This is a quantification uh, using a new method that was developed by uh, Hong Wu, allows, uh, allows us to look at individual spines. And what you see here is the distribution of spines that you see when either the principal whisker or the surround whisker is, is uh, activated. And you can see that there are, or maybe you focus on this, there are three types of uh, uh, spines. One is specific for the principal whisker. The other one is shared, that is it's turned on by the principal whisker and the surround whisker. And the minority, as you can see here, is turned on only when the, when the um, um, surround whisker is turned on. Now, how can we rationalize this? Uh, well, this is a, a, a summary of these, uh, of these data. You can see that the principal whisker and the shared inputs are about of the same size. It's, it turns out that uh, an overall, uh, in an overall uh, estimate, the shared, spines are, the shared input spines are slightly more um, frequent. The uh, unique, or the, the uh, Specific whiskers turned, uh, the specific the spines turned on by surround whisker is a small mi minority of less than uh, 10%. Now, um, okay, uh, let me see. How can we rationalize this <coughs> in terms of the network that I showed you in the beginning that we created by looking at anatomical matrices? convolved with uh, activity matrices. And uh, what I have done or what we have done is calculated on the basis of the anatomical maps and of the activity maps, the number of specific uh, principal whisker uh, spines turns out for layer four, turns out most of the uh, um, uh, spines turned on by layer four are specific. There's a minority of shared and a smaller minor, minority of specific uh, for the surround whisker. The reverse is true for layer five. A minority is, uh, is specific whiskers. Most of them are shared whiskers, and there are no uh, surround specific whiskers. So what, what you see here is the prediction of the distribution of inputs into spines based on this uh, model that I showed you in the uh, first part of the talk. Now. Uh, this uh, um, has to be a bit specified because if one looks not only at layer four, but also at layer uh, five, uh, 5A, 
layer two. That is altogether, we look at a, a number of uh, uh, input layers. We get the following picture. About 500 um, are specific for the principal whisker. 400 are specific for, uh, are uh, unspecific, they are shared. And 37 are, are um, specific for the surround whisker. This adds up in this, um, uh, with these assumptions to about uh, 1,000 spines, active spines, that are activated by a single whisker deflection. The uh, length of a dendrite in layer two is 8,000 micrometer. So on average, every eight micrometer on the spine, there will be an uh, activatable uh, spine. If you look at this, um, if you compare this with the real data, we are still out by a factor of two. They're actually uh, uh, somewhat more dense, but within a factor of two, the, the model that I showed you can explain uh, the distribution of shared um, specific, principal specific uh, uh, surround whiskers. Now, I think this is uh, the first example of uh, how do you use a connectome to rationalize, rationalize meaning quantify the input into a particular cell and uh, trying to find out how a stimulus is represented. Uh, I just want to conclude by saying we wanted to know how a single whisk, uh, or we sh I showed you that a single whisker deflection can trigger a decision. The, a, uh, a whisker deflection is represented differentially in the six layers. I showed this very briefly. And we have analyzed the uh, a network that underlies the representation of um, a uh, whisker deflection in layer two by convolving the input matrix, the anatomical input matrix with the functional output uh, matrix of the four projecting layers. What can we conclude from this? Since time has, uh, has um, uh, proceeded, I won't go into the details. I just want to leave you with the following hypotheses. Uh, at least in the barrel cortex, uh, in the touch system, there is not a sequential uh, activation of different cell types as it has been proposed for many years, especially in the, uh, in the uh, visual cortex. What's happening in the tactile cortex is that a uh, deflection is uh, simultaneously represented by different cell types. This is an example of a layer four and a layer five, uh, five B cell. The next step then is a uh, conveying of, this of the activity from these two types of cells into layer two and a uh, uh, spread of the activity into the neighboring columns via these, deep, uh, via these deep layers. So in order to understand maps, uh, uh, being it uh, uh, input maps or output maps, one has to establish first the connectome and then uh, 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 quantify this in terms of a connectivity matrix and then activate this matrix by the measured action potential frequent by the measured action potentials. The major conclusion is there is not a sequential uh, there is not a sequential flow of information that at least within the first second, it's always parallel. If you want to understand any layer, you have to look at all the connections in order to make sense. This is also true if, for example, if one looks at, uh, um, uh, you know, acti activity in spines. Uh, if you look at any one spine in such a cell, it is not quite clear or at all clear in the beginning, is the spine activated by a layer four cell, layer five cell, layer 5A cell or even a layer 2 cell. So um, this is basically my message. The sequential schemes of um, explaining representational maps of a sensory stimulus have to be uh, parallel, at least in the time, uh, time frame that is uh, important for uh, behavioral responses. Now, uh, I would like to acknowledge the work the anatomical work that was done at the Max Planck Floria Institute in Jupiter. I explained to you what Jupiter is. Um, most of the work was done by Marcel Overlander, 
who is now an a independent group leader in Tübingen at the Max Planck Institute for Biologi Biological uh, Cybernetics. Um, the other important collaborator is Hanno Sebastian Meyer, who will, will also return to Germany. We have a number of very dedicated uh, German uh, postdocs and doctoral students. The problem in the beginning was that um, locally it was very difficult to, um, to uh, recruit uh, people and we were very lucky to have these people come from Heidelberg um, and stay for one or two or three years with us. We collaborate with Christian de Kock, Brandy Bruno, and Vince Derksen uh, in um, uh, Berlin, and at the uh, with the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research. If anybody of you is interested in joining this, look up www.maxplankflorida.org. Now, looking at this building, when I came, I thought this can't be true there is no sign of a Max Planck Institute. You know, it's just a building. So I asked um, the administration then whether we could have a, uh, a banner. After some discussion, it was finally agreed that we have a banner, and this is how it looks like. Uh, first of all, it wasn't fixed, and was flapping around in the wind. You barely could see Max Planck, and I thought, Okay, this is a new institute, but uh, we have to do something about that. And the idea I had was I uh, got my own Minerva. You know? uh, first of all, she is much nicer. I think she is much nicer than the Minerva. Uh, actually, this is Athene. Uh, the other one is Minerva. And Minerva, on a kite, is very active. She pulled me through the water. But what happened most of the time is that she didn't pull enough, so something had to be done. Both about the building, about our collaborators, and about Minerva. And what happened is Peter Cruz dedicated a new institute. This is our new institute, at, at, uh, right next to where we stand. It has, has got a proper logo. This is Max Planck. Florida Institute with a beautiful Minerva. She's not as nice as Athene, I still maintain. And uh, I also got, uh, we also got new directors. This is David Fitzpatrick, who is the CEO and scientific director. Uh, I think he gave a lecture, everybody can see him. He's been extremely uh, helpful and uh, in, in getting this institute now going. And recently we were able to recruit uh, uh, Dr. Yasuda, after some uh, internal Max Planck drama, which I don't want to go into, but I can tell you uh, something about it. Quite a, quite a story, I must say. And finally, uh, and this is uh, what's important for me, we have a new kite. This is a, uh, a new kite, it's called a light wind machine and it pulls like a tractor. Thank you very much for your Time for questions. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I I was wondering if you had the chance to do something similar, or you're starting to do something similar with the inhibitory synapses. Yeah, so well how this is a, it's an obvious question. Um, we have a complete reconstruction of all inhibitory cells of the whole mouse brain. Uh, they are more complicated. They are more than nine uh, subtypes, but we have a complete map now of the inhibitory cells. The problem with uh, incorporating inhibitory cells in, into the circuits, that's what we do right now, is there is a, a quite a substantial number of uh, somatic synapses, and the method that we use to calculate synaptic uh, density is based on the overlap um, 
is not easily done with uh, synapses that are located on a somata. We, we are tackling this problem, but we will establish, uh, I hope in the next one or two years, a complete map of the inhibitory cells, and then we'll merge, merge the two, uh, the two um, uh, uh, circuits in order to have a complete reconstruction. Surprisingly for me, um, we could explain the distribution of active synapses of the shared and the specific type without invoking inhibitory cells. The reason for this is that we measure the output of the sending layer, not asking why, what are the determinants of the output of the, of the projecting layers. Uh, but this will certainly, or is, we are in the process of doing this. Uh, it's a bit easier or more reliable uh, because here we can use slice work to establish local, local circuits. The major problem, as I said, is uh, what, what is the distribution of inhibitory cells on individual uh, somata. Uh, so in two years, I think we have a complete connectome um, at the light microscopic level. Um, and just some initial result is that the activity of layer four cells, which, which is compared to their, their high innovation density by the VPM, uh, is probably almost certainly determined by co-activation of the VPM of the local inhibitory circuits, and we are just trying to model this. Okay. More questions or comments? Well, in the name of the organizer, Dr. Sackman, I want to acknowledge for this wonderful talk. Thank you.